But following up, we have, uh, again, from an educational standpoint, one of the topics that is hovering a lot and is very important to me, uh, I titled it the Horse Identification for Racing, the Next Generation. Uh, the thoroughbred identification for purposes of racing at sanctioned racetracks has been expertly undertaken by the TRPB for over 60 years through the use of patented lip-branded tattoos. As the horse industry moves into the microchipping of foals and issuing electronic registration papers, the next generation of horse identification for racing will be in transition with the TRPB and the digital, becoming the digital tattoo. So today we have Hank Zetlin, who currently serves as the executive vice president of the TRA, president of the TRPB, and is the corporate secretary for Equibase, for the Equibase company. In addition, he's joined with Curtis Linnell, a friend and the executive vice president of the Thoroughbred Racing Protective Bureau. He has been with the TRPB since its inception on the Wagering Integrity Unit in 2003 and actually formulated that firm's due diligence and betting analysis programs, which I think Ed Finansky can quote by heart. Um, but I'd like to welcome to the stage for the next panel, Hank and Curtis. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And we want to start by uh, thanking the National HBPA and Eric Camelback for having the TRPB here to talk about this topic going forward uh, and getting us down to New Orleans. Always have a great uh, excuse to get down here, eat some beignets. Before I get uh, started on today's topic, I just want to tell you a little story as a preamble to the topic. So I was back in Lexington a few days ago and in a stallion barn and there are three stallions and a retired greyhound and the bay stallion looks around and he says, you know, I'm pretty hot stuff. I raced five times and I'm a stakes winner. And the gray stallion chuckles a little bit and says, that's nothing. You know, I raced eight times and I'm a graded stakes winner. And the chestnut pu puffs out his chest and he says, well, that's really nothing. I raced 12 times, I'm a multiple graded stakes winner. All of a sudden the greyhound gets up and he stretches a little bit and he says, well, that's ridiculous. I raced 80 times, I won over 50 times. So the chestnut looks at the gray, he looks at the bay, and he says, can you believe the dog can talk? <laughs> so that's just a little bit of humor, but it also tells you the humor in it is the perspective one brings to a situation, right? So before I came to TRA and TRPB, uh, I was involved in Equibase for a couple of decades. And my perspective on Equibase, or our perspective on Equibase, back in the early 90s when Equibase was first formed, it was to have a database so that the industry would own its own data and in essence be able to print racing information so people could gamble in print product. And everybody would thought of Equibase as a racing industry company. Well, we kind of looked at it differently. We thought of ourselves as a technology company. And by thinking that way, by having that perspective, you start to think about a centralized database and all the applications of that centralized database beginning with simulcasting and the expansion, the ability to send out data to remote locations, the expansion of entries and results uh, on an international basis, uh, expansion of ADW wagering without that centralized database, you don't have the keys to that engine. Uh, so a lot of things, virtual stable, being able to follow uh, horses, jockeys, trainers, uh, for gamblers, late changes and scratches, all of those things came from the perspective of technology. So how does that relate to today's topic of horse identification? Well, Curtis and I view the TRPB not so much as a technology company, but certainly as a company that all the leverage technology for the security and integrity of racing. So uh, many people think of the TRPB as kind of a boots on the ground company with investigative agents on the backstretch and that's the way it was, but now not so much. Now the security and integrity is about leveraging technology. Uh, for instance, we have a wagering analysis and security platform. Uh, it's like a watchdog for wagering pools. So every bet placed on North American paramutual wagering, we're able to authenticate and analyze. 
uh, all the power mutual pools to ensure that integrity. So again, it's a technology application to the ensure the integrity of racing. And today's topic really in a lot of ways is about taking technology, it just happens to be old technology, a piece of paper is a registration certificate and tattoos as Eric spoke about, and changing that to leverage to today's technologies. And Curtis is gonna get into all those details. Uh, before he does, I wanna give a, an acknowledgement to the Jockey Club with Jim Gagliano and Matt Uliano, the Jockey Club Technology Services with Harold Palma and Chris Dobbins of Encompass, because we're working collaboratively with them. Uh, they're providing the hardware and programming for this effort, and also our data is speaking to each other. So leveraging data across just beyond the TRP, but, but including the registry, is really important to making this work, and you'll understand that more as Curtis goes through. So with that, uh, the, Curtis's background, I wanna introduce him as one of the world's foremost experts on paramutual wagering. He forgets more in a day that most of us learn in a lifetime. And he's been heading the integrity efforts of the TRPB for a lot of years. Oh, all the TRPB techni technicians report up to him and he'll be leading this kind of innovative transition over the next couple of years. Curtis. Great, thank you, Hank. Uh, first of all, I just wanna thank the, uh, the HPPA, Eric, Appreciate the invitation. Hey, uh, that last panel, it's about time for sports betting. Drew Brees, 50 million a year. How can we get him to 60 million a year? Excellent. So I guess that's coming at it and uh, we're, uh, we'll see where that takes us. Okay, let's talk about the digital tattoo and horse identification. Uh, normally I speak about topics like wagering and tote. So this is uh, something new for me. So I've, we've cobbled together some slides just quickly. Obviously, uh, we're very serious at the TRPB about horse identification, and this is one of the first horses ever identified and uh, tattooed with the lip brand tattoo, Yankee Dollar. Uh, obviously, we do the tattooing far differently uh, today, but certainly the verification of horses by the TRPB is, has really uh, stood the test of time, 65 years, and it has uh, been a passion of ours and certainly something that happens throughout Canada and the US. 20,000 thoroughbreds every year uh, are identified by about 65 of our technicians through the US and Canada. And we have uh, applied the lip tattoo to over 1.3 million horses uh, since it was first patented. Okay, so what's important about all this, and let me just Again, quickly go through. Uh, that's the tattoo dyes, and this is the, uh, the, the lip twitch. And of course, uh, here is the actual tattoo. Every year, approximately 600 horses are identified as being uh, identified as the horse, confirmed, but yet their descriptions do not completely match what's written on the papers. So the technicians will actually add to the, uh, the markings and the identification of that horse because the horse itself is primary. The horse itself is, uh, let's go back one, is the descriptions and markings of the horse is primary in terms of horse identification. Uh, what the tattoo is, is a supplemental uh, item to ensure that that horse is correctly identified. There's over 50 horses every year by the technicians in which the papers are such a mismatch that they'll actually call for uh, DNA retesting. So 50 horses don't seem a lot in 20,000, but 50 horses getting into races that were not confirmed of the identity is a very big problem. So these are technicians that, that take their job very seriously and are passionate about horse identification. So now we go into uh, into the microchip. So what we have, this, this is a microchip. And starting in 2017, all thoroughbreds fold in the US and Canada will have a microchip embedded primarily in the nuchal ligament in the neck on the left side. Uh, when the foal is DNA tested, the microchip number is scanned and is sent to the jockey club in order for the papers to be issued. There was also, it should be noted, about 50% or over 50% of the 2016 full crop that was chipped, in addition to all horses of running age in California in a pilot project. Uh, 
in uh, in Canada, there is a policy of the Canadian Thoroughbred Horse Society in order to implant the microchip uh, in a nasal region. I'm not sure where that policy sits today. We're going to talk to the CTHS and see if they've updated that. But primarily, the microchip is implanted in the nuchal ligament on the left side of the horse. So, uh, we started in 2017 uh, by outfitting all technicians with scanners. So as part of the horse identification process itself, the markings, the horse, uh, all the description of the horse, we also scan for the microchip and we verify that that microchip, uh, this is a scanner. Uh, uh, first of all, it reads. Uh, if it's not on the papers, then we would make an addition to uh, a supplement to the papers uh, to put that number. But it reads, and if you see right here, and I guess, uh, let me see if I can have the, the pointer. Right here is the microchip number on the registration papers. So that has already been part of our process of identification. So there's been a debate in the industry for a number of years, and, and most passionately at the TRPB, about microchips versus uh, lip tattoos. And we have said, and we have come down in that debate after having this for about 15 years and seeing the rest of the world going to microchips, that we can see uh, a process problem with either of those two used. And we are an investigative company, after all, and so we have looked uh, extensively at every case in which there was a mix-up of horse identification. And not just because we're sitting in Louisiana did I use uh, Louisiana uh, example of uh, mismatch of horse identification, but there have been some very high profile occurrences in the past three or four years. Now again, in Louisiana, both horses that were misidentified ran in those races. Uh, they uh, ran in uh, three races occurred. Uh, obviously unacceptable uh, from a horse identification from our standpoint in the industry, uh, but that has occurred uh, more than one occasion. So that's with uh, horses that are tattooed. Well, uh, not to uh, be outdone, our friends in the rest of the world and at a British race course this spring at Yarmouth, uh, Yarmouth had a, a mix up of two horses, uh, two fillies, a, a, a sophomore ran in a juvenile race, uh, won the race. Uh, they only discovered this well after the fact. Again, both horses were microchipped. And so in investigating each and every of these instances, this, the overt act or accidental is bringing an a, a incorrect horse to the paddock for a race and that horse does not get correctly identified. Tattoos are only as good as the people who flip the lip and look at them. Microchips are only as good as the people who scan them. Obviously, in both of those cases, after the, after the identification is determined based on a number, that number has to be checked off a list, and that is the point of failure. And this obviously concerns horsemen, because in every case, when there's a mix-up in horse identification, not only is it a huge black eye, for the industry and, of course, betting that has occurred on that, but the, the, the trainer always gets fined. Uh, you know, so even though the horse identifier may get fired, the trainer gets a, a big fine and, and it's a big problem. So as an industry, as an industry, we cannot be 99.9% .9 correct on horse identification or in, in the tele, as uh, Verizon and the, and the telcos tell you, you'll have 99 0.99% uh, uptime of service, that's not good for horse identification. We have to be correct 100% of the time. So that means a process. So the process that we're envisioning, and again, we're in the very early stages of the digital horse tattoo, is to have a process in which we can be correct 100% of the time. So we see the next generation of horse identification actually revert back to the primacy of the horse itself, the descriptions and the markings and the characteristics of the horse. I'm not sure if we just go back to that set of papers and, and this is something I noticed uh, fairly quickly. If you look at this, and obviously the print is very small, that description is tremendously, and, and you know, thanks for Graham Motion for putting up this horse. We, we found one which was a, 
a brown bay horse, looks the same as everything else. And it's amazing that the level of description uh, that the horse has. There is no other horse in the database uh, that matches this exact description. And so we have the primacy of the horse description, which reigns supreme. And of course, every horse has, as a foal, to have papers. So let's take the horse identification process by the, by the technician. Not only will that technician have the ability to look at the written description on the full registration, but also uh, in the future with an app that is being developed by uh, the Jockey Club for use of horse identification for TRPB, the technician will have the ability to reference the full uh, pictures itself. And of course, we'll have the point of the microchip uh, being inserted in the full and also always uh, at the point, uh, also into the, the horse at the time of racing age. So we have now another step in the process that ensures the horse is who it says. Uh, rather than just listing things off a list, it'll actually be the scanning of the chip itself that'll bring up the information about the horse, will bring up the digital pictures. So we have a, uh, again, just looking at one of our te tattoo technicians, this is Sharon Gunther, uh, again, one of the experts in horse identification and she's examining uh, all the parts of the horse that match the written description. We're gonna be able to add to that with the full pictures. So we have that benefit. Okay, so horse of racing age is a particularly nice one. I think this is Nyquist. Uh, again, looks kind of the same from a distance, but when you add digital, uh, digital photography, uh, as per everything described on the registration papers, or anything added for the horse or racing name, we have obviously the horse's face, body, and legs. We're able to capture the biometrics of the horse using digital documentation. So it's the digital documentation of the horse which proves the veracity of the horse's identification. The horse identifier in the paddock only gets to that by scanning the microchip through this application that's being developed the TRPB technicians at the time of horse identification will upload all that digital documentation. So again, it's a process that has some uh, tremendous uh, improvements over what's currently being done today. So what happens after the TRPB technician looks at this horse, identifies all the markings, also takes a picture of all the markings. This is a this is a cowlick uh, on the horse's neck. Uh, and that can be blown up in digital photography for a, a tremendous amount of detail. We can make 100% sure of the horse identification. Uh, we have some other points, obviously the, uh, what's called in New York, the night eyes, and I think the rest of us may call chestnuts, are very descriptive of horses. That will occur in the application, also available to the horse identifier. And so we have all these resources for the horse identifier uh, to be able to bring up upon the scan of the microchip. So that is the single point of failure. But what we also have, and just circling back to that single point of failure, is a digital application. And that digital application of horse pictures, pictures of the head, pictures of the front, pictures of the side, is also available to other officials. So not just the horse identifier. So uh, everyone from uh, the stewards, the test barn, racing commission investigators, security personnel, as that horse comes in, now we have a digital documentation or will have a digital documentation for many points of identifying that horse all the way through the process. There may even be uh, applications in which uh, that can be used for commercial purposes as we, you know, it is called horse racing, so pictures of a horse, rather than just a jockey or saddle cloths or silks, may be a nice addition commercially, uh, actually, to our, to our industry. So, again, I said, uh, we said this is fairly early days. We have, uh, again, we have scanners in the field. Uh, the plan is to have those scanners hooked up uh, to a Bluetooth reader, to a tablet. Uh, the horse identifiers will have tablets to take 
the digital photography, to read all the descriptions, to upload the application, and declare that horse TRPB certified, so the digital tattoo, in effect. Uh, also, access to the digital certificate will be logged. So the stewards will actually know that each horse that has come into the paddock has been scanned, that digital photographs have been brought up, that that process has occurred. When we looked at that single point of failure, it's because those processes haven't been occurred. So I think, well, it's not what I think. We, we are well on to an, a better process. And uh, again, with uh, development of the jockey, with the jockey club and the horse identification module, uh, we will get to the digital tattoo. And our timeline's fairly aggressive. We're looking at uh, by the start of 2020 to uh, be able to assign digital tattoos as opposed to physical ones, uh, that the technology be in, be in place, uh, racetracks across the US and Canada in order to have that as paddock identification uh, that may even be available uh, in other spots by that time. Again, the test barn to stewards and it'll, it'll be an open application. And we're, we're very excited about this next step in horse identification. We've already had some calls from some various foreign bodies, I won't name them, uh, quite interested in what our approach is because, again, that single point of failure on microchips, again, occurs over and over again. Uh, we see Ed Martin in the room. Uh, we'll be working with the Model Rules Committee of RCI to develop model rule standards for racing commissions and regulatory agencies. So that can be in place. So last but not least is our goal is not to change or supplement horse ID uh, going from the lip tattoo to the microchip, rather is to bring back the primacy of horse markings and put this in a modern digital world uh, and able to have many points in which officials that need the information can access the information. And when they access that information, that is logged. Uh, I also should add, even though we have HPPAs in the room for thoroughbreds, uh, is the Arabian horse industry is also moving in tandem with the thoroughbred industry uh, in the same fashion. So we're uh, attempting to address them because we do the uh, we do the identification also of Arabians of racing age. And uh, Mike Tanner's in the room. We're certainly having some discussion with the standard bread industry as well uh, to see uh, to make sure that. North America remains the, uh, the pinnacle for horse identification, and we eliminate those embarrassing instances in which uh, the process fails. So just with that, uh, I'll just ask Hank if I've missed anything or uh, wants to add anything. But uh, again, very early on, perhaps next year, we can come back and give a progress report uh, to this group. And, and certainly feel free to give us a call if you have any questions. Uh, we know we've won seven minutes into lunchtime, so we have a question. Uh, we'll make okay. it short. Yeah. Uh, no, we haven't. I mean, retinal scanning has been has been looked at over and over again, but again, the the single point, if you have retinal scanning uh, available in the paddock, that'll be one point of identification. What we want is an application in which the, the digital documented record can be accessible by officials all the way through the process. So multiple points of identification. But that digital data wouldn't be any different than, than the pictures of the, of the other characteristics of the horse. You know, again, it's just, my understanding is that, that the, the vasculature in the retina is, is relatively minimal compared to the vasculature in the retina of the horse. Right. Yeah, and, and, and certainly that is, a, that is a technology that's out there, but so is the biometrics of the photo itself. And, and digital photography with the markings of a horse uh, will produce an absolute unique record. And so we're confident of the digital markings across. Again, a foal is microchipped, uh, DNA verified, the microchip is then at the point of racing age, re-verified in order to bring up the full pictures. Those are replaced with horses of racing age. Again, the, the process then opens up to a number of different officials, but I appreciate 
uh, obviously emerging technologies. Well, one of the considerations has to be when you imagine the paddock with uh, two-year-olds coming out for their first race, trying to do a retinal scan. You know, you might not have the most cooperative two-year-old. So it's combining technology with the practical matters of what occurs at the racetrack. The, yeah. No. No, the lip tattoo, uh, again, that will be replaced with the digital tattoo. And the digital tattoo will be uh, a series of digital photographs and other characteristics that will be embedded right in the horse's registration papers and available. And again, we're looking at that process to occur as soon as January 2020. In the back of the room there? Are we sorry? The question is: Are we planning reciprocity with European racing? Uh, it, certainly, yeah, and and that's a great point. Uh, certainly, as as we see European horses come to North America, we have the same problem now. When European horses run uh, more than their first or second start in North America, uh, they have to be identified. Uh, again, some commissions have allowed them to make a start without a, without a lip tattoo. And so there needs to be a reciprocal uh, verification of those horses. In the electronic world, that becomes far, can be far less uh, problematic or far, far more seamless uh, than it can in the paper world, certainly. So that's a great point, and, and certainly we uh, have brought this up to foreign organizations and, and we'll have those discussions. Well, one of the nice things about collaborating with the Jockey Club is they have the same type of thing on breeding animals, going from country to country and the interchange there, the fact that we'll be part of the Jockey Club's database enables that to happen. Uh, the, I thought I saw a hand. Uh, yes, sir. Mike. If the, if the chip is malfunctioned or cannot be read, that chip will have to be replaced and the horse would have to be re-DNA verified. Uh, Oh no! I'm I'm talking at the point of identification of the of the TRPB technician. Again, the horse identifier will bring up the digital certificates uh, by scanning the chip. Uh, so again, it'll chip scan. If there is a misidentification, again, we'll have to deal with those contingencies. You can get to the digital tattoo through the horse's name, and obviously the right credentials to get into the application. Or the, that's how. You have, the, you have the other way to get at the information right. there. And the chip, you know, the, the failure of the chip, we've been looking at it. The Jockey Club's experimented with this quite a bit. It's actually a passive chip. There's not programming in it. It's the way the chip is manufactured amidst uh, when you have the reader, the numbers. So the chance of failure, we've not observed it. It probably will happen at some point. But at that point, you just go in by the horse's name. And you, yeah. and you can also preload, you know, on race day, you know who's in which race. So everything would be preloaded for the horse identifier. And we have some associations that do that now that are very conscientious. They go around, pre-examine horses before the day of racing, take some pictures. Uh, just one thing on the, the chip we haven't come across failing. Uh, however, the scanner may. And so there does have to be backups of scanner, which are, of course, Bluetooth enabled in order to get that application. But you can get that through the horse's name. Yes. Sir. The pictures will already be part of the application. So the horse identifier would have a tablet, for example. Uh, no, that ha and I'm sorry that again I tried to zip through so you know people I could hear people's stomach growling for lunch, but <laughs> it is New Orleans. That was me. Uh, the horse identifier when that horse is ready for racing age to ins to certify that horse uh, with a digital certificate it'll occur at that point. And then also the other question I have is the scanners that they are now just show a number. Yeah. Well, see, right now the scanner is just a scanner. I mean, it's just like a PET scanner. It, it comes up, it, it pops up the name. It, with the scanner being Bluetooth enabled to an application, you know, on a tablet, uh, not only will it show the name, but it'll show 
the horse's papers, it'll show a written description, it'll have a complete library of all the digital certificates, which of course, as you know, on a tablet, you can expand those, you can lighten them. There's, there's a tremendous amount you can do to see uh, clarity. And it, when we look at, you know, cowlicks and, and other identifying features, uh, chestnuts of the horse, we have a lot there to be able to be matched. And of course, it also opens us to new technologies. We, we talked about the myometrics, in which there's uh, malt or, uh, uh, micrometer measurements between horses' eyes and ears and such. Uh, that's an evolving technology that we're looking at, as well as um, uh, photo uh, matching, image matching, uh, that can be directly done. But all those things are only possible by starting this process. Thank you. Well, tattooing won't end. We'll be going from a physical tattoo to a digital tattoo. I mean, when will tattoo end? Again, all coming well, and we're looking at a fairly uh, aggressive timeline. We will stop applying new lip tattoos in January of 2020. Now, from a horse identification standpoint in the paddock, there'll be older horses who have lip tattoos. There'll be uh, younger horses, as as two and three year olds come along at that point that'll have the digital tattoo. So there will be a legacy period of overlap. Okay. Uh, well, currently the cost of horse identification, uh, first of all, the, the breeders are responsible for Im, Im, uh, betting the microchip and getting the horse DNA scanned. So that, that has already occurred over this past year and, and some of it in the previous year. So that has already happened and, and that's a cost for the breeder and, and, and doesn't involve us. We would look at the entire cost, all things being equal, and obviously we're very early into this and wouldn't want a commitment, but we are looking at the same cost and, and payment structure as we currently have, because that's worked. Uh, so the digital tattoo, again, uh, it's very early on, but we would, we're, we're looking to have the same cost structure uh, to the owner or whoever's paying for that. In some cases, it's HBPAs. In other cases, it's commissions by funds. In some cases, it's the track. Uh, usually, it's the trainer uh, going back to the owner paying for the, the uh, digital tattoo. Same structure as we have now. Okay. Great. Th again, thank you very much. Thank you, Art. <laughs> Hey, Curtis, we really appreciate you being here. I know um, as a professional horseman, change is always very difficult for me, as my beautiful wife, Deborah, can tell you. Uh, but we're changing with technology, and it's going to be better in the long run, but there will be some transition time that we'll need to go through. So thank you very much for that, and we'll take you up on that invitation to give us an update. Thank you. So right now we're going to open up the buffet lines for lunch. Um, I do want to ask everybody to be back in and ready to go at 1.30. Uh, we have a wonderful keynote speaker. We want to give him as much time as possible. Special thanks to the Illinois Thoroughbred Horsemen's Association, Express Bet, the Kentucky HBPA, all for sponsoring lunch. We're ready to go.